Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic Episode. I'm Barry P. Cook, and I'm here to talk to you about the latest episode of Secret Invasion. It was called Betrayed. And at the beginning, we have a trio of Skrulls heading out on a mission carrying the files of specific military operatives that they're going to impersonate. Next, some of the members from the meeting that Gravik was previously at, the meeting of the council, visit his facility where he explains that the people from the previous scene will be impersonating the military members whose files they had in order to carry out an attack, as well as that the experiment his people have been working on will create super scrolls, which are versions of scrolls that can mimic the abilities of others, not just the faces. We get a flashback to New York City in 1998, where Fury visits a diner at which he meets with someone called Vara, who is the scroll that introduced him to Gravik and apparently the one he's married to in the present. And I just want to say right now that I hate the glasses that he wears in the present. Uh, it's not a good look for him. Anyway, in the present, he tells her that he's retired and that since he's not one for golf, he may take up revenge in his spare time. She reads him the riot act, though, about how after she mourned his loss from the blip, from which he eventually returned, he ended up taking off again and leaving her by herself. But this time of his own free will. Fury seems to think that she's been in contact with Gravik, and she does get a cryptic phone call, which she shrugs off as nothing important, though Fury is obviously dubious. Gravik talks with Gaia about who ratted out their group because he thinks she did, which it seems is the case, but she insists it was Brogan, and he at least pretends to buy that. Apparently, he and she are going to London for a parlay with Keller, aka Talos, about her, during which Gravik says that Talos is lucky. He hasn't sent Gaia back to him, her father, in a body bag, at which point Talos attacks him, but he's made to stand down by a room full of Skrulls, who all take on the appearance of Gravik. Talos tells him that he's not going to let Gravik continue his war on humans in anonymity, that he'll expose Gravik and his people, because the humans will rally together against a common foe and be very formidable, because... Nothing brings humanity together like a common, common enemy. As he's leaving the meeting, Talos bumps into someone and a phone is dropped, but then picked up and handed to him. After the meeting, he meets with Fury at a pub and it's a bit contentious given how they parted ways before. It turns out that the phone was a handoff from Gaia, which had intel that they can use. Apparently, a British sub called Neptune is going to be used in the aforementioned attack which is apparently going to be directed at a bunch of UN delegates on a UN plane in flight over the area in order to get the humans to get at each other's throats. So Fury called Sonia, Olivia Coleman's character, who busts his chops about having planted a bug in her office, telling him that now she's renamed her owl Nicholas Fury and has given it a little eye patch. He asks her to do something about the sub-attack, but she said she's too busy trying to figure out who exposed her butcher shop operation. He then talks with Talos about how Talos and his people were the ones who gave Fury all the intel he needed over a number of years that allowed him to ascend the ranks at S.H.I.E.L.D. while on their way to some kind of government official's house to stop the sub-attack by trying to force the guy, who is of course a Skrull, to call it off. But when he declines, Talos ends up shooting him and then has to try to get his code word from Gaia as the sub, which has received the order to fire on the UN plane, gets closer to actually doing it. So, Guy goes into a room where the actual Bob is being held, the actual government official, and fishes the code out of his mind, allowing Talos to impersonate Bob, using the code word to call off the attack. But she exposes herself in the process, causing her to have to flee, which she tries to do on a motorcycle, only to be stopped by Gravik, who seems to tell her that he set up the attack on the plane to try to find the traitor in his midst, which he apparently has, before shooting and seemingly killing her. Meanwhile, Fury's wife gets a call again and heads to a train station where she retrieves a safety deposit box of some kind containing a gun, at which point she gets yet another call telling her to go to a particular location, at which point she asks to speak to Gravik, but isn't allowed to. And that's where the episode ended. So we're halfway through the miniseries now. And I think this episode was better than the first two. It had a little bit more meat to it. There was this impending attack that they had to put off. And 
you know, there was some tension at the guy's house when they're trying to get him to call it off and he won't. And then guy asked to get the code and then now she's in trouble. So she flees. So I thought, you know, it was a little more substantive than the previous two episodes. So that's good. But they're going to have to get a lot done in the back half of this short season to really have this miniseries have any kind of real punch. I'm really hoping that Gaia isn't actually dead. She gets shot and she goes down, but I'm hoping she's not dead because I like Amelia Clark and I'm, I'm, I'd am I'm rather see her in the next three episodes than not see her in the next three episodes. Also, it would suck if Talos loses his daughter. I'm not sure I buy the idea that Olivia Coleman would not, you know, the Sonya character would not have helped to call off the attack. I mean, she gives Fury the name of the guy that they had to go after in order to get the attack to stop, but she doesn't really take any action. And I find that to be a little weird because her government would have been on the hook in a way for it, at least in public perception, because it was a British sub. And, you know, if it came out that she knew about it in advance and didn't do anything other than give Fury a name, like, I think that would look bad for her. So I'm not sure I buy that she would have just said she couldn't do anything because she was trying to figure out who outed her butcher shop operation. Found that a little hard to believe. Also, he was fired last episode, so why didn't he have to give his phone back with all his contacts on it? Like, how was he still able to call her? And why would she take his call? Like, would she not have known he was fired? I mean, they don't announce that to the ally, you know, to various allies that, and people that the operative would have had contact with that not to talk to him anymore. So I was a little confused about that. But that's really it. Like I said, I think it was a decent episode, a little bit better than the first two. And I'm looking forward to the back half of the season, which will start next week. But that's really it. So I'm going to get out of here. I'll be back uh, soon. Until I return, I wish you peace and long life.